Okay, the next person we want to look at is our friend E. Huang, um, uh, or E. Te Ge, as he's often referred to. Uh, Te Ge E. Huang, uh, 16th century, about 300, cent- 300 years, 200 years later. Uh, e. Huang, of course, has figured prominently on Korean currency. You have his face all over the currency. Anyone have a, is it Manwen Jari? It's a Manwen Jari note, isn't it? Ten, huh? Oh, huh? Yeah, a thousand one note. Okay, yeah, E. Huang. Yul Gok is what on the Ocheon one, and who's on the Mon one? Uh, Sejong. Sejong. Okay, all right. So currency of Iwang is all over there. Uh, Iwang, of course, is very important, um, very prominent Korean Confucian scholar. Um, as I was remarked this today at lunch, Iwang, as a political figure, actually doesn't really appear until he's almost sixty-eight, uh, and then after the age of sixty-eight, is appointed to the court where he became uh, the scholar of the mat, the court mat, which meant that he gave lectures to the king every day. Uh, he was also in charge of his own academy. He became dean of the National Academy for Confucian Studies, but he turned that down. Uh, he was appointed a, a censor. He was also appointed a private investigator to in- investigate corruption. He had a lot, a lot of offices. Most of them were outside of the capital, and only very late in his life did he actually get to the, co- the capital. Uh, Iwang was born in uh, 1501 in northern Gyeongsang province. Uh, he did pr- belong to a, a pr- prominent E clan. Um, how that Jinsung E clan came into prominence is still unknown. Uh, one of the things that uh, we know that E Tejo, in consolidating his power for the dynasty, did often sell the right to use the E family clan name to people that he needed help from. So that E. Tejo actually allowed people to take over the royal family name if they would, in fact, contribute to E. Tejo's own government. So it's like selling off your birthright, right? Or selling off the use of the name. So there are a lot of E clans at the beginning of the Chosun dynasty. And which one, the one in Jin one from which E. Huang came, uh, I don't think it's associated directly with the, um, the royal family, uh, but you never know. Okay? E. Uh, Tege also, he was the youngest among eight children. Uh, and he's reputed, according to both the biographies, by his uh, descendants as well as others, of being a child prodigy. Uh, he memorized the whole collection of uh, Tao Jian's poetry that's in China. Uh, and it is said that, in fact, by the age of 18, he himself had published a whole volume of poems and so forth. At the age of 20, he began to study the Book of Changes and thus consequently Neo-Confucianism. When he was 23, he came to Seoul entered the National Academy, uh, and in 1527, so that's um, roughly four years later, he was able to pass the preliminary exams, became a government official, but then went back to school. So he returned to the Sungguan at age 33. Uh, he was a friend and compatriot of Kim min Hu, very important uh, political figure at the time. In 1534, uh, four, um, uh, seven years later, he passed the second civil service exam, uh, but continued to uh, work in the academy. Um, after that, uh, at, the, at the age of 37, his mother died, so he retired to his home village, where he mourned her for three years, and was given various provincial appointments up until the age of 39. Um, and uh, then he started his own academy. So he preferred to stay at home, teach, pe- teach students within the area, um, Professor Wagner, uh, my teacher uh, of some time ago, uh, actually did a presentation several years back in which he looked at the so-called lineage charts of great Confucians in the Chosun dynasty. And 75% of these names that appear in lists of candidate holders and office holders and so forth claim, made the claim that they were associated with Yi Huang. <laughs> Everyone wanted to be a part of his lineage because of his prominence and the high regard with which the Yi dynasty kings held him. Uh, his integrity was is uh, is well known, and uh, in the Edaisky Chronicles, that he's constantly referred to as a man of integrity, who is relentless in the uprooting of corrupt government officials. Okay, on three occasions, Yi Huang did run afoul of other uh, bureaucrats within the government, and he was exiled. Now he wasn't exiled to an island as others were; he was just exiled back to his hometown. <laughs> so he was asked to leave the government, stay there for a while, and then he was called back. Uh, Iwang apparently didn't like government very much, nor did he like any kind of the struggles that went on with the, in the royal court. And many times he, in fact, pleaded to get out of offices in the capital himself. 
But nevertheless, the dynasty king constantly called, called him out of retirement, uh, made, allowed him to hold several positions, uh, both in the royal court and in rural areas. At the age of 48, he was in, in, uh, created as governor of Pungi, uh, and his, during this time, in his mid-40s, that he uh, helped to uh, refurbish uh, Solwan, which are these private academies that were created in the countryside. Uh, he was named Tessasong, or head instructor of the, of the Singuan, in, in, at the age of 52. In 1560, his own Tosan Sodang um, uh, was built, uh, and then King Myeongjong uh, actually brought him back to uh, court, so that at the age of 68, he then receives um, the first uh, court, uh, court appointment. Um, at age 67, uh, he was sent on an embassy to the Ming Dynasty, uh, returned to become uh, officer or lecturer of the math, that is the court lecture. I, every morning he would have the king come and he'd give him a lesson, and then the king would go about his business. So that was very important. Um, he, then at the age of 68, uh, he was in, uh, invited to join the chancellery office, uh, where in fact he was in charge of documents, and it is during this time that he wrote uh, one of his most important um, uh, texts, which is uh, this one, uh, The Ten Diagrams on Sage Learning, or the Songhak Shipto. This is a wonderful text, actually, it is a kind of manual for a king. And it lists what a king should be thinking about from the moment he wakes until he goes to sleep. And it's divided up into chapters, how to train the mind, how to train the virtues, how to uh, sleep well, how to eat well. Uh, and it, again, it's filled with Confucian theory. It is in this, uh, actually, it's ten diagrams with explanatory notes. He actually diagrams the human heart and shows how... Uh, things can influence the heart, shift it left or right, make it good or bad, and so forth. And uh, Koreans love to draw diagrams of metaphysical um, concepts and so forth. Um, he gave the lectures to the king, uh, to Sun Jong at, at that time. And Sun Jong was so entranced with them that he actually had the whole of the book published on a 10-panel screen in the, in the royal palace. So the king's lecture room actually had this beautiful 10-panel screen on which all of Che Ge's lectures, in fact, had been inscribed. When he also served in the uh, court, he was also compiled a compendium on Song Dynasty Confucian scholars, uh, extensively running through all the collect known writings then of those Confucian scholars, um, and put it together in um, the history of the new uh, Confucian and the Song and Ming Dynasties. And uh, then he, when he retired, Yi Wang, in fact, uh, retired at the age of 70. Uh, he returned and he engaged in a very famous uh, set of debates, with a man by the name of Kide Sung, uh, in which he clarified what, how he understood Jushi's notion in regard to the uh, cultivation of virtue. Uh, there was an issue that uh, Yi Huang was very concerned with, that is, what causes our emotions to go towards bad objects? In other words, if we have emotions that are good, and they would naturally seek out justice, propriety, shame, and uh, uh, compassion, then what causes our same emotional makeup to choose to lie or steal? So he, like uh, Jushi, he would say that all of our emotions are based in these good impulses, and yet there are people who steal and lie and are not trustworthy and so forth. So he did a, a keen analysis of all the writings of Neo-Confucian philosophers to find out what causes good emotions to turn into bad passions. And a whole series of treatises that he wrote on that. Then uh, he had to discuss this with others, people, he corresponded with people as to what he did. He, of course, uh, came to the conclusion that even in spite of apparent evil within our emotional makeup, there is underneath bad emotional responses good intentions. So we actually defended the idea that even under our apparent evil, we have good intentions. And he gives the classic example of the thief who steals bread, it is an act of theory, but it's intended to, in fact, feed a family. So the impulse to steal bread is actually directed by the impulse of compassion and humaneness. Uh, so, uh, again, sounds very optimistic. Um, he believed that, in fact, uh, the principles of the universe were so strong within human nature that even in the face of evil acts or behavior, uh, these were still operative, so that the principles, we in a sense, cannot ever really be evil. Our, our apparent good can be masked by circumstances, but our intentions never will. 
That's the four seven debate. Yeah, the four uh, good intentions versus the seven disordered intentions. So an example would be greed, which is actually uh, the negative side of compassion. Right? We have compassion for those that are close to us. When it's carried to its extreme, it can become greed. Okay, but most often times, compassion is compassion. But when it's extreme. Pushed to its extreme, then it in fact becomes becomes evil. He re- believed that in fact what caused good emotional uh, responses to events to become evil was the endowment of the body. He said basically it's your body that corrupts your intentions. So it sounds very stoical, right? The body's overwhelming needs can corrupt your nature's intentions. Yeah, it sounds very very Buddhist, right? But he didn't thereby deny that, that it was, he never denied the need for, for emotional response. Uh, he just needed that this emotional response had to be ordered by ordering the body. And he did engage in asceticism. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard about this, about uh, Yangban culture. There was a series of exercises that Confucian literati in, so- in Korea do to keep their body fit. Uh, have you ever seen this? They actually go up and hit themselves against trees, right? It's a kind of stress test they do. And I've seen this in, in villages in Korea where you know, an old man will get up at 5 o'clock and he'll sort of push himself against a tree. Uh, it, it's somewhat masochistic, but it, the idea is that you keep the body from interfering with your good heart. Okay? Um, and, and there is a sense to thing. He also, in his uh, diagrams on sagely learning, um, actually told the king that, that the way he could control his emotions and, or his private interest was always to go to sleep while lying on his back, putting his hands at his side, and letting, allowing his last thoughts to be of Confucius. So before he falls asleep, he should think about Confucius. When he wakes up, he is thinking about Confucius. Okay? So the last thought he has before sleeping is to think of the sages, first thought, and so forth. Uh, he also prescribed... Um, uh, cold showers, I guess the equivalent of cold showers, uh, for Confucians. Uh, his, his writings on, on Sunbi life, the life of the scholar bureaucrat, are really quite interesting. They're almost stoic. Um, but the idea is you eat little, you sleep little, uh, you don't obviously engage in exercise or anything like that. You don't allow your life to think. He was very much skeptical of people laughing so he apparently never told jokes. <laughs> he thought that that was an unbridled expression of emotion. So he's, he's not real no, well known for telling jokes or even you know, making no, puns. Huh? No <laughs> oh, I, I suppose he knew Chinese literature. There are a lot of jokes in Chinese literature. <laughs> Four centuries la- uh, three centuries later, a man by Kim, the name of Kim Satgat actually told a lot of jokes. Uh, he was a Confucian scholar too, but he knew, he told these really dirty jokes in classical Chinese. And, and the, the funny part is because when you read them in Korean, they sound like pure Korean words, which are funny, uh, but actually their meaning in Chinese is very classical, you know, like obtain virtue and stand upright, you know. But when you read it in Korean, pure Korean, it means something else. <laughs> Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, you know all the things about Kore- uh, Korean scholars, you know, who never used to expose their hands. This was very common. Their hands would never be exposed because they didn't want to engage in manual labor. They walked, they, they had to walk and they walked very slowly. When I first got to Korea in 1970, that's what I was told to do. As a foreigner, sh- don't walk fast. Secondly, don't wear glasses in public. I was told to remove my glasses. I didn't wear them, but now I wear them because of uh, old age. But uh, don't walk family and never walk with your hands in your pockets. Okay? And the whole idea was that you know you, you always walked as a scholar walked. If you run, that means you had a disordered mind. Right? And, th- and therefore you should be very uh, cautious about everything you do, every thought, every step you take, and so forth. Uh, tw- Yi Huang was the champion of that. He had very, very strict codes that he enforced at his own academy as to how people should, what kind of clothing they should wear, how they should, in fact, move about, and so forth. Um, and he, the image is that of a very stern man. But 
Seventy percent of those who pass the civil service exam within 100 years of Yi Huang's death claimed him as their teacher. Okay? Whether they were actually a part of his lineage, we don't know. But they, they wanted to be associated with him. He is the archetypical Korean sage that uh, people wanted to be associated with. Right? Uh, Yi Huang, of course, was the author, also the author of many books on Confucianism. Uh, his own view, of course, is uh, purely orthodox. That is that it is the principle of the universe that has overriding control over the formative elements of the universe, i.e. physical bodies, our you know, internal organs and so forth, that in fact it, uh, to do evil in fact was hard. Uh, to be good was easy. All it meant was that you let go of the influence of the body. So if you can control your body, you would then be naturally good. Uh, Yi Huang also was defender of the notion that ordered laws of the universe not only take precedence over any particular circumstance, uh, but that in fact, through the understanding of the classical materials, through the understanding of, the, sp of the, the speeches of the sages and so forth, we can always know what is good. Right? And the particular circumstances of the individual or of society, in fact, cannot obscure what already is contained within that. Um, Yi Huang, I've looked at Yi Huang in, in terms of many of his things, Yi Huang was what I would call a principled rigorist. Um, he, uh, he believed that, in fact, if there is a good in the world, we abide by that good in all circumstances. There is no sense of expediency. You cannot adapt a principle. A principle must be fulfilled in circumstances A, B, C, through Z. All right? And in that sense, he sounds, I mean, almost looks or sounds very Germanic. That is, the absolute principle is always defended no matter what the circumstances under which it's invoked. That's quite different from other Neo-Confucians, who were quite willing to compromise certain principles if the effect would be okay. All right? But Yi Wang, in fact, uh, maintained that principles, in fact, must be defended from beginning to end, and really there is no um, great, uh, greater worse, worse thing to do than, in fact, to uh, compromise a principle. His di Ten Diagrams on Sage Learning which he composed in 1568 for King so Seijo, was based upon a series of lectures of rulers. From uh, Traditional Confucians had affirmed that a man could learn to become a sage and that sagehood was attainable to anyone. Yi Wang intended to present that path by starting each chapter with a diagram of image which he drew from the writings of Zhu Xi. He intended the ten diagrams for the king's instruction to be uh, made into a 10 battle screen and also as a short book um, the, so they could constantly review it. When I first got to Korea and uh, entered Seoul National University, one of the gifts I re received was a photostatic copy of the original 10 diagrams. Wonderful book that had actually come from the Tosun Soan. Uh, it took a while for me to read it and so forth. Um, uh, as a result of t uh, his, both his prominence during the reigns of King Sojo as well as the materials that he published, uh, Trege is a living concern today. Uh, the Trege Studies Institute, uh, the, the Tosan So One, um, and actually Kyungbuk Univer National University's Institute for Trege Studies all opened up within the last 30 years. In fact, testified to the fact that Trege's influence continues. Uh, Trege is, in fact, the most commented upon by both Chinese and Japanese authors. Japanese authors who were exposed to the writings of Trege uh, actually consider him to be brilliant. Chinese Neo-Confucians, or those uh, working in New Confucianism within China, also consider that Trege was really good. Uh, they don't find him terribly creative, but they in fact recognize that he understood Jushi better than Jushi understood himself. And so uh, where there are comments contained within the Chinese tradition, they often refer to Tege. Tege is um, as good as the Chinese were, ever were in their uh, understanding of Neo-Confucianism.